Welcome to the show. This evening our guest is Jim Colby, who is candidate for the Congressional District, District 5. This is part of a three-part series that we will be airing before the election, uh, hoping to help you when you go to cast your ballot at the ballot box. We will have uh, Jim's opponent, Jim McNulty, on a show, and then we will also have a show on the health propositions that you will be voting on. So we hope that you will stay tuned for all of these. Let me tell you a little bit about Jim's background. He received his, his, received his bachelor degree in political science from Northwestern University. And then he went on to get his master's in business from Stanford University with a concentration in economics. He served in the Vietnamese War and he ran for Congress two years ago. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Alan. It's a pleasure to be back with you. What have you been doing in the last two years, Jim? You know, it's certainly been a busy two years. I've tried to make a point to do some of the things that I've always wanted to do and have been too busy because of the years that I've spent in the Arizona legislature because of my business to get involved with, and that's a lot of community activities. To really find out what makes this community and the people in southern Arizona tick. And so shortly after the last election, I was asked by a number of groups to serve on their boards and to get involved with their organizations and I uh, said yes to them and suddenly woke up one morning about three months later and realized I was on 21 separate boards and I stopped saying yes at that point. But I've been had an opportunity to be involved in the uh, Target Jobs program which was a program to match unemployed people with uh, jobs that were available in our community and that was more than a year and a half ago at the depths of the recession and it was a real shot in the arm for the community. A year ago, I was very much involved in the flood relief, organized a group of volunteers to go up to Moran and help people dig out of their homes. And I'm serving on the board of directors of the Casa de los Niños, the Pima uh, Foundation for Children, the Crime Prevention League, and uh, the Arizona Foundation for Children, and uh, the Community Food Bank, and just a number of other groups, too. I recently read, um, well, not so recently, I guess um, about nine months ago, I heard you speak at something, and you mentioned that uh, you had adopted a child in the interim and, and I was a little curious about that because you and your wife don't have any children. No, that's right. Sarah and I were married seven years ago, both of us in our, our mid-thirties mid and of course Sarah has a career at the University of Arizona on the faculty there and so we didn't have children of our own at that point and uh, we did have this rather extraordinary thing happen to us just a really a year, year, about two years ago, shortly after the last election, when a young, per young man that I had gotten to know during the campaign, partly, be mostly because of my activities with children, all the, uh, the orphans airlift and the, my involvement in legislation, writing the Foster Care Review Board legislation, brought Kevin to me, where Kevin had been a foster youngster. And when Kevin turned 18, there wasn't anybody that he could turn to for help. And essentially, he showed up on my doorstep one day needing help shortly after his 18th birthday and we took him in originally just very temporarily and one thing led to another and on his 19th birthday uh, last December he became Kevin Colby and it's been a wonderful experience for all of us I, I have to tell you it hasn't been easy all the time um, but I think it's meant a lot to Kevin for the first time in his life to really have a permanent family I think that's a wonderful story. Thank you, Ellen. I appreciate that. It's, it's really been, I assure you, it's been good for us. Uh, we've learned a lot about raising kids <laughs> in the process here. <laughs> we skipped the diaper in the orthodontic stage, but we, we've sure got the teenage stage in spades here. Oh, well, we'll let you fund somebody else's <laughs> orthodontistry. I mean, you okay. shouldn't escape life without that's getting right. that pleasure. We'll be right back, and we'll talk about some more serious things. For instance, balancing the federal budget. Colby, 
candidate for Congress in the 5th District is our guest, and he will be running against Jim McNulty. Both of you had to be Jims, huh? Confuse the issue. Well, the last names are different, and yeah. a lot of things about us are different in other ways, too. I remember one city council race when there were two Kennedys running against oh, yeah. each other. Yeah, that's, that happens a lot. In fact, down in... Uh, in Cochise County two years ago, there were two O'Reillys running for judge, and that really confused people down there. We promised that we'd come back and talk about the budget. Um, certainly had a lot of discussion so far, but if, if you were elected and you now were in Congress, how would you treat the question of a balanced budget? Ellen, the most important thing we need to be doing at the federal level to get the budget under control to, is to reduce federal spending. I think we need to take a look at each part of the budget and find ways and places where we can uh, make some savings. I've identified, uh, more, for example, in the defense budget, about $49 billion of savings which might be made without really cutting into the muscle of our national defense by doing more competitive bidding. You, you may not know, but the Defense Department only bids about 5% of all of its contracts in competitive bidding. Competitive bidding could save us a lot of money if we did more of that. Changing the spare parts procurement program. Um, the weapons procurement program, all of those kinds of things uh, could save us a great deal of money. And each part of the budget needs to be examined in that way. But first, I think there are a couple of institutional things, mechanical changes that need to be made in order to bring about a balanced budget. And I think the most important thing is a balanced budget amendment to the Constitution of the United States. It's very clear that Congress is unwilling to impose the discipline upon itself to balance the budget. And we're going to have to do that from outside. I served six years as a state senator, and five of those were on the Appropriations Committee, so I know what it is to have to establish some priorities in spending. And one of the things that helps you do that is the prohibition in this state's constitution, as almost every state has, against spending more than you take in. And I think it's important that we have the same kind of prohibition at the federal level. So I strongly support a balanced budget amendment. It's the only thing that's ever going to bring about a balanced budget. Well, people say that if you really got down to balancing the budget, that most of the budget is entitlements. And what are you going to do about that? You're talking that, about social you're talking about Medicare? Yes. You're not, not social, social not right, social security, sorry. right. No, but it's sorry. some of the other programs right. are right. Medicare and Medicaid, for example, are, are two of the major uh, entitlement programs that are in there. And those are those are some of the real causes of increase in the federal uh, uh, federal deficit. I don't believe that we should do it on the backs of people that are receiving Medicare today. Uh, the most important thing to do to keep Medicare costs from rising, that's the problem, Medicare costs have been going up like this while, the, while other things have been rising like that, so the gap is growing larger and larger. And the most important thing we need to do is keep health care costs down, and that brings the federal government's payments for Medicare down. And we are doing some things uh, at the federal level which is helping to those things are helping to keep uh, health care costs down. And I think, for example, of the diagnostic related groups, DRGs, which give incentives to hospitals and doctors to find a, the quickest way to get a, make a patient well and to discharge them. If they do that faster than the average, the hospital gets to keep the additional money that they would get from that Medicare payment. Uh, so it, the incentive is all on the hospital to try to get the person well as quickly as possible. Greater emphasis on health maintenance organizations, preventive health care. I think those are some of the things that we can do in that area of Medicare, which is the biggest single entitlement. But we have to look at each part of the budget. There is no one part of the budget that's going to do it. We're going to have to try and make those, make those cuts everywhere. Well, you are running as a Republican. President right. Reagan, of course, is a Republican. And President Reagan says, we cannot balance the budget. We must have this large amount for defense spending. Now, if you were in Congress, how would you vote? Well, President Reagan has not said we shouldn't balance the budget. He's well, I mean, he says that, but he said we can't do it because... He, no, he has said that uh, Congress has not made the changes in the laws and has not been serious about balancing the budget uh, in other areas. Uh, President Reagan has increased defense spending, but you need to look back at a little historical data on that from between 1960 and 1980, defense as a percentage of the federal budget dropped by more than half from about 52 percent to 24 percent. And as a percentage of the gross national product, that is all the goods and services produced in the country, defense dropped by more than half. So we, had, we cut very dramatically, largely as a result of the Vietnam War. We cut the amount of money that we spent on defense. And as I just pointed out, I think there are ways that we can save money 
in defense. But there's no doubt about it that we've got to spend something on our national defense if we're going to ever improve that. And let's keep in mind that more than 50 percent, almost 60 percent of the defense budget goes for personnel costs. That's salaries for the people, salaries and pensions for the people who serve or did serve in our armed forces. So it's not these expensive gold-plated weapons systems that people keep talking about. We can make savings there, but that's not the sole answer. We'll come back in a moment, and I want to ask Jim about um, tax cuts and also about nuclear disarmament. We'll be right back. My guest is Jim Colby, and he is running for Congress in the 5th District. He's running against Jim McNulty. His background is a bachelor's degree from Northwestern University, surprise, surprise, major in political science. Uh, and he has a master's degree from Stanford in business with a minor in economics. Um, let's, let's just talk about taxes, because that is a corollary to the, to the budget. If you were elected to Congress, what would you do about raising or not raising taxes? Well, Ellen, Ellen, I would start by saying I wouldn't raise taxes, and I'm even more adamant than the President is on that in that regard. I, from what I just said about the problem that we have with the budget, uh, my view is that Congress has got to get its house in order on spending before we ought to be taking more money out of people's ta uh, pockets. The answer isn't to raise taxes. Raising taxes only puts uh, the brakes on the economy. It is the quickest way to make sure this economic recovery comes to an end. And the Mondale tax plan that my opponent uh, endorses uh, calls for $157 a month in additional taxes for the average family. Now, I know I don't have $157 floating around that I want to give up uh, to the federal government, and I don't think they should. We should have to do that. I think government ought to make do with $157 less. Uh, in its spending programs, and I th think we can do that. So I will oppose tax increases, just pure and simple. I will not do that uh, until we can, at least until Congress can show that it can control its appetite for spending. Nuclear disarmament, that's kind of the underlying issue that when you read political columnists, they say the one thing that makes people the most nervous about President Reagan is his stance on nuclear disarmament. How do you feel about it and what would you do? Well, I have a very strong view that we need to bring about a, a significant reduction in nuclear arms in this world. I don't think there's a person listening to this program or a person uh, in this country that doesn't want to see the number of nuclear weapons decrease. I believe very strongly that we can bring about peace, peace through strength, but I think that we can bring it about best in terms of when we talk about nuclear arms reductions through real reductions of arms. I think the uh, uh, freezing at the unstable levels that we're at right now just doesn't make much sense. Uh, that is a prescription to keep the world on the edge of disaster. What we need are reductions in the number of nuclear weapons, and that's what I favor. In fact, I have come up with a program, which I've dubbed Sound Start, which is a fairly complicated and complex uh, proposal for nuclear arms reductions, and it would reduce the number of nuclear weapons very significantly so that both sides reduced and we're at a parity way below where we are today. The key to it is to make it impossible for one side to successfully launch a strike against the other. That's what we need to do, and that means reducing the number of weapons. Would you be for on-site inspections? Oh, we've got to have, yes, you've got to have on-site inspections. We can do a lot of things today without, uh, through our satellite uh, verification. We know what's being produced, and you can tell what is. Uh, what kinds of weapons are being tested, because all that can be spotted from satellites. But there are some things that I think are going to require some on-site uh, verification. And I think the Soviet Union will agree to on-site verification. It's going to be a sticky issue and a very tough one, but I think it's one that we can reach some agreement on, on the conditions for that on-site inspection. How would you rate your stance on nuclear disarmament vis-a-vis -vis President Reagan's? I think the President believes very strongly in uh, nuclear arms reductions. He has said over and over again that he wants to see the number of nuclear weapons reduced. And that's certainly a feeling that I share, and I think that's a feeling that all Americans share. The question is, how do we get there? Uh, and I think there may be legitimate differences of opinion 
over how we get there. But I certainly believe, as he does, that what we ought to be looking for are reductions in the number of nuclear weapons that, that exist in this world today. If you were elected to this seat, uh, what committees would you choose to be on and where would you put your main efforts? Ellen, I, I think any person that's elected from this congressional district is going to be looking at uh, committees that have significant impact. Uh, for this district. And uh, those that come to mind for me are the uh, uh, Agriculture Committee, because we do have very important agricultural interests, the Interior Committee, which is so important because of the water, uh, the wilderness, and all the other issues uh, dealing with the Interior, and Armed Services Committee. Now, those three uh, are very, very important, and we have important armed services interests in this district, and so those would be my three top priorities for, for uh, committees to get on. Would you be interested uh, or work for uh, legislation for children? You mentioned yes, earlier that you, that you worked on that when you were in the state legislature. Yes, it's, it's really been one of my uh, areas of great interest, as you know. Uh, I did sponsor the Foster Care Review Board legislation. I've sponsored the legislation in the state on domestic violence, which makes it possible for an abusing spouse to be removed from the home. Uh, I helped overhaul the juvenile court system in the state. I'm very proud of the legislation I sponsored. Uh, in the Arizona State Senate as chairman of the Judiciary Committee for children. And I would do the same at the federal level. There's not too many people that speak out for children. They don't vote. Uh, and it's, they don't have a lot of defenders, whether it's at the state legislature or in the federal government. And I certainly would like to think that I would be one of those advocates because I believe that children are a resource for the future. Uh, and it's something that I would want to do. Uh, and there's some good legislation that's been proposed, as a matter of fact. Um, my colleague to be from, from the Phoenix area, John McCain, has proposed a very tough child molestation law which would essentially make life imprisonment uh, for those kinds of cases that have a federal implications of those crossing state lines, and, and I would support that. What would be your stance on a constitutional amendment banning abortion? I'm opposed to a constitutional amendment banning abortions. I, I, my view is that it's one of the most difficult decisions that a woman her doctor, her family, and her God ever have to make. I don't believe that sitting as a legislator in Phoenix or in Washington, D.C., I can make that decision for the woman. But I recognize how, how absolutely divisive this issue is for the American people. And I believe the federal government ought to stay out of it altogether. My view is that the government ought not to be in the business of either writing a constitutional amendment, but it shouldn't be in the business of funding abortions either. And on that regard, I do have a difference with my opponent. And so you would not favor funding abortions? I would not favor federal funding of abortions. I think there are alternatives that are available. Uh, I'd, I'd really like to see us put a lot more emphasis on alternatives. I, my interest in kids uh, certainly reflects uh, my, the importance of adoption. I was on the board of directors of Adopt Co-op for many years in this state. There are literally thousands of people in this state alone who are waiting to adopt a child. And if we could maybe put greater emphasis on that as an alternative uh, solution, I think we could, we could prevent a lot of abortions from taking place. What would you do for the poor woman who could not afford an abortion? I think there, and, 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 and believes that that is the solution that she must seek, I think there are alternatives, as there are now, as a matter of fact, for that woman. There are doctors who will uh, do that. Uh, there are organizations that will assist uh, in that kind of a service if, if it's absolutely necessary. You mean private organizations? Private organizations, yes. Um, let's end this segment by talking about your stance on prayer in the schools. Okay. Um, my view is that uh, the prayer amendment is a valid one in the sense that I think voluntary prayer, uh, a moment of silent meditation, a minute of silent meditation such as we have in this state is reasonable. And yet that same approach has been ruled out by federal courts in, in a case in New Mexico, as a matter of fact. So I think perhaps a constitutional amendment is needed to say to, the, to local school districts that they can at least do that kind of thing, make those decisions locally about the kind of, of prayer or the kind of meditation that they want to have in their school districts. And I favor that. I think school districts ought to make those decisions. Uh, locally. I don't believe that our founding fathers intended that all observance, religious observance, was to be removed from public life. Congress begins every day's session with a invocation and so does the legislature uh, that I served in uh, here in Arizona and virtually every legislative body, city council and so forth begins that with a prayer. And I, and I think there's no problem with that. I, I think it needs to be done in such a way that it does not become offensive or does not impose on the will of those who are you know, in the schools. 
What about the children who come from agnostic families? Aren't they, they don't, put on the hot spot? They don't have to participate, I don't believe, uh, in that. I think that as long as you make it voluntary, they, uh, they don't have to. Uh, we have, uh, for example, we have people who don't, won't say the Pledge of Allegiance uh, for religious reasons. And yes, for those children, that perhaps causes some problem. But I don't think that means we're going to say we're not going to say the Pledge of Allegiance either. We'll come right back. Jim Colby, candidate for Congress, is my guest. Jim, you ran against McNulty two years ago. Mm -hmm. He won. He went to Congress. If you had won, what would you have done differently than McNulty oh, did? Oh, gosh. <laughs> how, do, do, how much time do we have in left? Two minutes, in two Jim. minutes, Jim. <laughs> well, it, that's really the issue of this whole campaign, because he and I do differ very fundamentally. I, we've already mentioned the balanced budget amendment, for example. I would have voted very differently on, on that. I support line item veto authority for the president. I think it's a powerful fiscal tool and I think we ought to give it to the president. I would not have voted for the subsidization, subsidizing foreign copper producers with eight and a half billion dollars of loan authority to the International Monetary Fund. That's just putting our people out of work and those loans aren't going to be repaid. So we would have a fundamental difference there. Uh, on agricultural issues, we have a very major difference. He has voted 89% uh, of the time against uh, the uh, agricultural interest, and that's according to the American Farm Bureau. Uh, so on those kinds of things, we have a real difference. And I guess the bottom line is, um, on my very first vote, I would not have cast the vote that he did, and that's for Tip O'Neill as Speaker of the House. Uh, I believe that the time has come to make a change in the leadership of the House of Representatives. We need somebody who supports the programs of economic recovery, of providing jobs, not more taxes. Well, gee, you have about 45 seconds left. Well, we can, we can talk about somebody else that, on that, that way. I'll tell you that I do think that I, this campaign is going to be a different campaign from 1982. We, have a, we had a tough campaign then. We came very close, but as you'll recall then, the unemployment rate was 11 percent. Now it's down at 4.5 percent. I don't have the primary I had. Uh, instead of uh, Babbitt and DeConcini at the top of the ticket, it's President Reagan. So. I think things look very good for us, and the voting record, I think, is the major thing that's going to make the difference. Well, I thank you for sharing your opinions with us. Thank you, Ellen. And good I, to be with you. Thank you. I hope this has helped you in making up your mind, and please do try and stay tuned, not stay tuned, but be tuned when we present the other two programs that we're going to have in this series before the election. <laughs>